you got to keep the big picture that, hey, we're changing the world. We're changing the world. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to be consistent. You have to be consistent. We're speaking with people that are sending a pulse through their industry. But none other than Tony Hawk, Todd Peterson. Yes, the Isler, everybody. Thanks for being on, Jordan. The League presents Electric People. We are here today with Chad Wright, fresh off the mountain. Thanks for joining us today, man. How are you? What's up, brother? Doing good, man. It's been a, it's been a quite an adventurous couple of days. I love Utah. It's probably a good thing that I don't live here, though. Really? Because I would just be pure hiker trash. That's right. And, uh, yeah, we just thought we were flying you in for a podcast, and he's already climbed. He's climbed two more mountains than I've ever climbed living my entire yeah. life in Utah. Well, how many mountains have you climbed while living here? None. Yeah. So yeah, two none. more. Yeah. So. That's I mean, it. I've taken the chairlift up. Adam's literally <laughs> from here and looked at the mountains that you just traipsed mm -hmm. right over. I for lived his whole at the life. bottom of Mount Olympus like my whole life. No kidding, yeah. man. So that um, is so beautiful. Chad Wright, we're super excited to have you on. So Chad is a U.S. Navy SEAL, recently retired, yep. correct? Yep. And ultra marathon runner. We were just discussing how many ultra marathons you've run. I have twelve, and you don't know, but think that's somewhere. He's in got there. a baker's dozen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't really keep count, Ty. What what classifies <laughs> it as an ultra? So ultra is what fifty miles so or more. Ultra or what? is anything over twenty six point two, which would be the marathon distance. So the first kind of stepping stone for ultra running would be fifty kilometers, uh, and then you go from there hundred k, hundred miles. Is how many miles? Thirty one and some change. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the American in me that has to know. Yeah, no or worries. Like this many meters, how many feet? Oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, as, as we've kind of gotten to know you and delved into your, your, uh, your story, um, you've been on a lot of podcasts recently. Um, there's articles on you and what you've accomplished. And I think some of the things you've accomplished physically are incredible. We're really interested in your story. Um, the stuff you've accomplished and that you have to speak on as far as mentality and positivity is really interesting. So we run a, a sales force of direct sellers. They knock doors. They're, they're at the forefront of an industry that's very mentally difficult. And uh, a lot of your story will, will help. But before we dive into that, let's, let's do this. So when you've been in Utah now for how, like what, 40 yeah. hours maybe? Yeah, yeah. Less, hours. less than two days for well, sure. Yeah. yeah. So Adam, I guess, tell the story of how you guys met and what he's done since. Yeah. So we um, we had the opportunity to work with Jesse Itzler. Um, we had him come speak at one of our leadership conferences back in April. Mm -hmm. And then we had him on our podcast a couple weeks later. So, uh, and everybody loved him, obviously. Jesse's an incredible guy. And I follow him on Instagram. I noticed Jesse's training for an ultra marathon right now. Is it an ultra? Or is he doing a He's last doing like man a last man standing, standing thing, type right? race, right? That's, that's and, the rumor. That's so the <laughs> that's the rumor. And I saw Jesse post about running with Chad and working with Chad and kind of told a little bit of his story. Then I followed Chad on Instagram and really kind of started like digging into what Chad had going on and then just reached out to you um, on social media. And Chad was like, hey, that sounds like a ton of fun. And, and I think, you know, my story could you know resonate with your guys. So uh, we had him fly out. I actually said, Hey, I'm going to fly out Wednesday morning and that's, that's today. And then just work all day. And he said, if you're cool with it, could I come out a day before come kind of get the lay of the land and, and then I'll meet you down there. And I said, yeah, of course. So, um, Fly him out here yesterday. And My in, idea of lay of the land is like check out the Starbucks, like see head, where like the hotel is, you know, where the hot tub's at. Like yeah. he's gonna go get a new shirt for this fan, <laughs> new fangled podcast he's gonna be on. You know what I mean? And uh, nope, he's climbed two mountains in two days <laughs> and uh, managed to still get here on time. So uh, and he looks like he's spry as can be, just ready to keep going. So how many vertical feet have you done today? Or in the last two days? Mm, yeah. I would say minimum 10,000 in the last two days, I would say. Is it different here than uh, oh, man, it's, back east? Yeah, it's totally you're different You're from Virginia. Here. Yeah, yeah. Or you're from Georgia, living in Virginia yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So from Virginia. So, yeah, the main difference here, man, is just the altitude. Because, you know, it's even like we did a race out in New Zealand uh, a couple months. Well, I guess it was last January. And you can get true four or five thousand foot climbs in new zealand but you're coming from sea level mm -hmm. so when you reach a summit the air is still saturated with oxygen whereas here it's like you get a five thousand foot climb and you're at 
10, 11,000 yeah, feet. Right. And uh, look, man, this guy right here, he doesn't go to 10 or 11,000 feet <laughs> unless he's about to jump out of an airplane. <laughs> so so uh, it slows me down for sure. Yeah, yeah just, just need some time to acclimate, but I'm sure it's you like been the good. Challenge, though. It is, man. It is. I've learned a couple, you know, just kind of reinforced a couple of my own mantras. Uh, over the last couple of days, you know, trying to make movement up these mountains in that thin air. So it's been awesome. Well, when we were talking before um, we sat down and mic'd up about, uh, you know, the guys in the other room were looking at you and said, you know, there's some good sized guys and say, how many people like our size become Navy SEALs? Because you're, you and me are more probably similar, you know? And you had said that a lot of times it's slider guys like, like that, right? Um, as you, as you, do these runs and all these, are, how, how are you physically? Are your, is your body all right? Is this, I mean, this stuff is really, really hard on you, yeah? Yeah, it is hard on you. So, I mean, when you're really training to, to do these races and to win these races, you're almost constantly battling some sort of injury, ache, pain. You're, you're really walking a knife edge when you're training to your maximum potential, right? And so it's a dance, man. You've got to balance that stuff. Um, but look, yeah, I mean, you talk about team guys. How do team guys look? You never know, dude, because it doesn't really matter. It's, it's the stuff that you can't see. It's the stuff behind the eyes that, that really makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Because we're all made of the same stuff, dude. We're all made of dirt. There's how no you, difference between me and you, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. How do you know, so this is kind of just jumping right into it, and I still feel like we're not still done with the introduction, but so like you're so mentally strong and you like you said it's just we're all made of dirt but how do you know when where's the line between saying to myself cat i just got to push through this injury or if i don't stop right now i'm actually going to be injured and then i won't be able to race for a while you know what i mean because yeah. sometimes there's times where you're like no i just got to push through this i just got to push through it my ankle's hurting or my toes hurting or whatever yeah. it is and you're like no i'm gonna just fight through this mentally where, where, I mean, and I'm sure you struggle with that sometimes. Well, the thing about it, knowing your body to that extent is a journey. It takes a long time and it takes a, a, a lot of experience to be able to know your body well enough to know when you need to back off or when you can push a little harder. And if you haven't reached that point in your own personal journey, it's good to have a coach because the coach is there to kind of to kind of lead you through that. Um, but right now, man, dude, this is what I've done for so long, starting, starting with Buds. That's when my running career, in my opinion, started. Mm -hmm. And um, for everybody that doesn't know Buds is SEAL training, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. And so I've been doing it for so long, I just know my body. And then when race day comes, you don't think about that. Because on race day, you run until you either break or achieve victory. So you have to be willing to sacrifice your physical body to achieve victory. And that's the mindset that I have. And the reason I have that mindset is because it simplifies things. There's two outcomes on race day. I either cross the finish line or I break and don't finish. But I'm not going to not finish unless I'm broken. Yeah, that, so it's so that simple. as a way to simplify it is crazy because foregone conclusion then you can probably silence that inner voice that's mm -hmm. telling you like hey man you're tired hey that feels weird ow that hurt you right yep yep let's uh if you don't mind let's dive right into becoming a navy seal um and some of the adversity that you had to go through i just listened to a podcast where you talked about this and i was really inspired by that story well and before you go thank you for your service by the way you were a seal for how long 12 years 12 wow. years yep. incredible so um i know people probably say it all the time, but yeah, I mean, we really appreciate your service and, um, it's really respectable and, and we're, we're really excited to have you on. So oh, thank you guys this. for your support, man. Yeah. It was a, it was a pleasure. I got to go to work with the best men that our nation has to offer for 12 years. Heroes. Cool. Yeah. That's, that's the guys that, that I was surrounded with for 12 years. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way, bro. That's a great way to think of it, but you're out there sacrificing yourself for us, and that's, that's definitely something Thanks, we appreciate. Fellas. I appreciate it. So let's, for the guys that don't know your story, um, let's dive into it, because it wasn't just, it wasn't just hey, I'm going to go out to, to Bud's, and I'm going to try my hand at this and become a SEAL. That, that wasn't your story. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a fairly unique story. Um, so when I graduated high school, um, I went to work at a at a concrete factory doing construction type work. And why is that valuable? It just goes back to the the same point that we said earlier. We're all made of the same stuff. I don't have anything that you don't have, Ty. We got the same tools, brother. It's what you do with them, right? So I decided that I wanted to do something special, that I wanted to be a SEAL. And Just so that- out of nowhere? You have a military well, family? Or? No, no military family. Um, really, I'll tell you what it was, Ty. When I was in construction, I, really, I came to a point that I realized that if I didn't change direction, that this was my lot. Mm -hmm. What was surrounding me was what I was gonna get out of life. And for a lot of people, that's fine, bro because I knew a lot of dudes and I still know a lot of dudes that have an everyday job and they go and do the same thing every day, but they're happy with that. And that's awesome. If It's all about what you're happy with, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't want anybody to ever think that I'm better than anyone else. It was just my decision. I wasn't happy with my lot at that time. So that's kind of what drove me toward the decision to join the military and then in particularly the SEALs, dude, that was something I just saw online. I didn't know anything about SEALs. I just... Yeah, because that was before the books and the movies and stuff, right? Like yeah, it's yeah. Probably, there was bit. a little bit of stuff out there, but it definitely was not as, as uh, you know, popular as it is today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was something I found online, the hardest military training in the free world. And something in me clicked and said, that's the direction I want to go. So that became my dream. 100%. I was I was totally invested in being a SEAL. So um, I got a, I got a SEAL contract, um, went to Navy boot camp, made it through boot camp. Well, before I went on to SEAL training, um, they do a dive physical, which basically checks you out from head to toe, inside and out. They want to make sure you're 100% before they send you off to this training, right? They found I had a pericardial cyst on my heart. So this cyst is of rare condition. They didn't know a lot about it, but they did know that it was asymptomatic. So it wasn't causing me any, any issues in my day-to-day -day life. Um, but the Navy was concerned that when I was diving and we'd go underwater and the pressure change underwater would cause the cyst to burst. So they came back and said, Chad, you can't be a SEAL. Um, we're going to send you out to the regular Navy. And there again, that's fine, but that wasn't my dream, right? That wasn't what I had set. That wasn't where I, I set my goals. That. I didn't know it was... So you could have just been fine. You, you oh, yeah, yeah. You could have not fixed that and lived a totally normal life. Yep, yep. It was totally asymptomatic. I but I, I I had set my goal at, you know, seal the, being a SEAL. So um, we had to pull some strings, man. And I was able to get out of the Navy on an administrative discharge. <clears throat> when I got out of the Navy, I was a civilian again. Went back to my hometown. Saw all my old buddies that knew I had went off to the Navy. And, of course, they all thought, well, what are you doing back here? Mm -hmm. Chad couldn't cut it. They yeah. all thought I couldn't cut it, brother. And that's what it boils down to. And that was hard, man, yeah. because I was like 19 years old. That was tough. Um, and I'm sitting here saying, well, I actually have this thing on my heart. And they're like, whatever, dude. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Everybody that quits buds has, has an excuse. Reason. You that's know what right, I mean? Yeah, right. but but so that that was really tough, man. And so I started going around to all these surgeons, heart, heart surgeons in, in Atlanta, and trying to find a surgeon that would take this cyst off my heart. Well, every surgeon I went to was said the same thing. Uh, you know, why would we risk an open heart surgery to remove something that's not causing you any issues? In their eyes, the risk wasn't worth the reward. Yeah, right. Um, so we went to probably three different heart surgeons and heart surgeons aren't a dime a dozen. I mean, they're hard to find. And we finally found a guy named Dr. Cooper 
and Dr. Cooper had spent some time downrange. Uh, he was a he was a army, um, either a reservist or a national guard. So he had worked in hospitals downrange. He knew he understood stood what I what I wanted. So went in saw Dr. Cooper. He was the first dude that was like, Roger that. Let's do this, man. Really? And um, yeah, yeah. So I remember. Um, driving to the hospital the morning of the surgery and this is the only time I can rem remember doubting my decision to to take you know this risky surgery and I, I looked at my dad and I said man do you think that I should go through with this it's like four in the morning we're driving to the hospital and he just looked at me and said son if you want to be a seal you don't have a choice and when he said that, something, it just clicked. I was like, Roger that, let's do it. So went and laid out on the table, put me to sleep. Um, this, sur the surgery was successful. And I remember waking up, the first words I said when I came out of anesthesia, my grandmother was standing beside me and holding my hand. And I looked at her and said, I got my dreams back. That was the first words that wow. I said coming out of surgery. And from there on, it was, it was rocking and rolling. I, I, I spent about eight months, six to eight months recovering. Um, I think I was back in the Navy in less than a year. And I showed up and the same dive medical officer that disqualified me from being a SEAL, I walked into his office and I'll never forget the look on his face. And he says, dude, what are you doing back here? And, um, Eight months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> From having like your chest opened up, and then I mean, even like you got a rest and the atrophy in your right, like, and you yeah. can't train like crazy to get back, right? Like that's. Yeah, I mean, l luckily I was healthy going into the surgery, yeah. and I was young, recovered really quickly, and then just put everything into recovery, and then really getting back in shape. Um, and so it, it went it, it went by quickly, you know. So how was how was training for you? Do you feel like that event or that that situation made the I mean I'm sure it was hard, but no question you're not gonna graduate at that point, right? You've put too much into it, you've you've invested so much, right? Well the other the other to add to that question, say this experience didn't happen to you. How do you feel like knowing yourself, how do you feel like you would have handled Bud's training? had you not been DQ'd the first time versus how you handled it after going through all that? Yeah, Adam, that's a hard question, man. And there's no way that I can answer that with 100% certainty. But I will tell you that I think without that adversity, I would have had a far lesser chance of making it through SEAL training. And when I went through SEAL training, I went straight through. I was never rolled. I never failed a single evolution. Um, I went straight through from end to end, right? How common and is that? That's pretty uncommon. That's pretty Most uncommon. Most guys have to do a well, couple. How yeah. many? How many people start? How many people start a, a well it, training? I don't know what, what's it called. It, Just, uh, it fluctuates. It fluctuates depending on the needs of the Navy. But when I was going through, we started our class with 300 guys, and these were these were prime guys. These were the best that America had to offer, college athletes, Olympic athletes. Um, and we graduated with 18 guys at the end of six months. And is that so, uncommon or is that pretty much what they see? I, that's pretty standard. That's wow. pretty standard, yeah. And, I mean, and it's a refiner's fire. Yep, that is, it is. So, but yeah, back to your question, by me going through that furnace of adversity prior to Bud's, it definitely purified me. It purified my intentions. It purified my want, my will. Why do I want this, you know? And yeah, coming out the other end of that furnace and it was a hot one. It was like, it's time to rock and roll. Nothing's gonna stop me short of, of death. Mm -hmm. Can you, I wow. saw a post you had on Instagram the other day um, about the bell that stares at you. Mm -hmm. Can you, for the, for the people listening that aren't familiar with Bud's training and that bell, will you explain just to the layman, what, what is the bell and why is that something that's significant with Bud's training? And I guess just explain how it all works. 
Yeah, so buzz training is voluntary. So all you have to do to get out of buds is go ring a bell. And that bell is everywhere that you are. They put it on the trailer hitch of a truck and they follow the class around with the, the bell. It's the oh, I man. quit. It's basically yeah, saying, yeah. I'm quitting. Yeah. I can't do this. I'm ringing the bell. That's and right. From what I understand, if you ring it, there's no, that's it. You can't be like, hold on, hold back. on. I, no. I'm good now. Yeah, you there's can't no. put your finger on it so it doesn't keep ringing. <laughs> there's no going back, brother. Yeah. No. Like, ding. Sorry, no. sorry. No, I'm good now. You yep. can't do Look that. Look my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> so it's there all the time staring you in the face. I didn't face. know they, they, they had purpose, to come around with it. Oh, so yeah. they're purposely putting it there yeah. saying, here's here's how to alleviate this pain. Yeah, There's a meal and a blanket on the other yeah. side. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's no, there are no questions asked. There's no, nobody's gonna belittle you. The guys that quit buds, we, the guys that make it through buds, we don't belittle the guys that quit buds. Right. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, man. Mm-hmm. They're, no, they're no less than we yeah, are. This job's not for that, that, Yeah, it's just not, man. So yeah, the bell follows you everywhere. And, and let me ask you guys, if you already know this question from Instagram, don't answer. But I don't know it. So. What, what do you What do you think is the number one reason that people go and ring that bell? Man, Are we talking deep reasons or like what what, whatever can? comes to your mind. Man, I think it's. I'm imagining myself in that situation. If I got to a point where I feel like I was going to do it. I think it would be the agony you're currently feeling, but more importantly, the fear of not knowing what's coming and just thinking it's going to get even worse kind of thing. Like, I can't handle what's going to, like, if it's this bad now, I don't think I can handle what's coming even mm-hmm. in the future. I'm out. Yeah, I, I'd probably say the similar thing. Just seeing seeing the the current situation that you're in and not being able to grasp what it looks like from like a larger perspective. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and, and I'll, as far as your answers go, sometimes with buds, it's, it's actually a better strategy to not know what's coming, depending on the way your brain ticks. Mm-hmm. So that's the strategy I took. I didn't, I didn't research what was coming the next day. I woke up every day and took the day little bites at a time. So the biggest reason, the number one reason that people quit buds the number one reason people quit ultra marathons, the number one reason people quit uh, a business, quit their job, whatever it may be, it's all the same reason, man. They're looking at the whole mountain, brother. Yeah. You just talked about it earlier. They're looking at the big picture, right? So it's like when I was climbing Mount Olympus yesterday, you got to break it down. And Bud's is the same way, you got to break it down. You, you, like yesterday, climbing the mountain, I would go from shade to shade, a piece of shade to a piece of shade, because if you're going to stop, might as well stop in the shade, right? So that's how I broke that down, shade to shade. In buds, I would break each day down individually. So when I woke up in the morning, my only goal was to get through the morning. Get that was always the hardest like part. That, yeah, man. it was just to get through the morning, not even to get to lunch, because when you're waking up at 4 a.m., and you're nice and cozy, and the first thing you got to do is go hit the Pacific Ocean and cover yourself in sand. You know, that's a pretty hard way to start the day, mm-hmm. um, and, and it, it just stays that way. So, yeah, if you can get just break it down, you get through the morning, you get to lunch. Well, when you get to lunch, man, you've only got like four or five hours left in the day. So all the guys that quit buds – when the instructors would come to them and ask, hey, man, why are you quitting? Nine times out of ten, the answer would be, because I just can't imagine doing this for six months. But if you ask those people, well, could you have done this for another hour? Could you have done this for another minute? I guarantee you their answer would have been, yeah, I could have done this for another minute. That's just 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. But... Instead, they get in their head and they look at the whole picture and it overwhelms them. That's so true. That, that's it. So in our job, it's direct sales. It's a lot of rejection. And a lot of people come into it. I'd imagine like the SEALs where the people that, you're, that, are, that are trying to complete this training and become SEALs, you said it. They're not nothing. They are, they are elite athletes. They are mentally strong people. They're the best of the best. 
a lot of these guys will come here and it takes them longer than they thought or it's harder than they thought or the rejection affects them in a way that they didn't think it would mm -hmm. and they'll look and they'll say man i only have one sale how in the world am i going to do a hundred of these or it's taking me two weeks to get my first sale that must mean and then the thought is too overwhelming for them yep. instead of saying you know breaking it down into small like bite-sized pieces yeah i could do this if i just knock one more door yeah could you and everyone do one can more? knock one more door right yeah i heard tell me if this is true um i did a tour of of the buds facility once and it was actually on a friday that hell week was ending so the helmets were still lined up uh and there were a couple people that were coming out of the showers and you know I've only seen it once, but the way you walk after Hell Week from just being chafed mm -hmm. and everything like that, it was an incredible experience. Um, but I was told by the guy giving us the tour that when they ring the bell, they immediately go talk to like a psychiatrist or something like that. Do you, is that true? They had mentioned that they'll go talk to him because some people have their, becoming a SEAL is everything to them. And if they lose it in that moment, they almost don't know how to mentally yeah, process yeah. it and it can be damaging. Yeah, and, and I think that that is... Um that's probably a thing they do now. I don't know if they were doing that when I went through buds, uh -huh. um, but the prop that, that so that's an that's an issue that I see a lot of a lot of guys, whether it be seals, professional athletes, um, musicians, whatever, they identify with that one thing. Mm -hmm. As a team guy, it would be so easy for me to identify with just being a seal, and that happens to a lot of guys. But when you leave the SEAL teams, it's a machine, man. It keeps rolling. So when I was medically retired this past January, um, it was tough. But luckily, I identified with other things. I had kind of diversified my identity, and that helped me push forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. Was that a conscious thing that you did? Or looking back, are you like, oh, well, I had these couple other things? Because I can see how saying goodbye to your family, telling all your friends in Georgia, I'm going to go become a SEAL. I can understand coming back and saying, no, I have this heart thing. Well, for the people that just ring the bell going home, I'll bet that's a lot to handle. Is it something you think you consciously did where it's like, hey, I need to put my eggs in a couple other baskets or have a couple other things that I do that I'm proud of? Is that something you consciously did? or It was not a conscious decision. But I will tell you, when I realized that my Navy career was probably going to be over soon, I was maybe a year out, I started doing other things because I had time. Mm -hmm. And that was such a blessing that I had time to do that because I'm going to stay busy. I'm going to push myself. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out in the field um, do, doing and I was able to have time to diversify myself, but it wasn't a conscious thing. And just recently, I have realized how important it was that I did that. And I didn't even know I was doing it at the time. Is that how you found running? It seems like uh, that, that mentality is, seems consistent from a lot of people that are team people that are putting out content right now, from Goggins. Uh, we've interviewed Jocko before. Uh, and they all have that. It must be an incredible association because they all take these things, well, the ones that I've met, and they want to keep going. They don't get out of the Navy and be like, I'm tired. I'm going to rest for a while. It's I'm going to challenge. I'm going to try something else. Is that pretty common in your circle? Yeah, man. So that's a big mantra of mine is, is don't, don't die in a chair. Don't die in the chair. I refuse to die in the chair, brother. I'm going to die out on the field of life doing my thing. And that actually came from a run. That mantra came from a run. I like that. That's um, really powerful. Yeah, yeah. So where that came from, and I don't, I don't mean to get off subject from your question. I think that is a common thing in SEALs, to answer your question. A and that mantra came from a last man standing race I did a few months ago, where I ran 116.5 miles in 28 hours. And you don't stop on those. We, so the way the race works is you've got one hour to run 4.16 miles. So you try to run that 4.16 in about 55 minutes. And so you come into your crew, crew station. There's a chair there. Your crew's got some food and water. So they're basically topping you off, shoving food down your mouth while you sit in that chair. Well, before I started that race... A good friend of mine was crewing me. He was my crew chief. He was taking care of me in between laps. This good friend of mine was my chief at my last SEAL platoon. Mm. His name's Brandon Tucker. 
he won't mind me using his name. And I could only promise Brandon one thing before I started that race. I said, Brandon, I can't promise you victory <clears throat> because my body may break before we achieve victory. I said, I only promise you that I won't die in that chair, that I'll die out there on the field on my feet. And that was the only promise I could make him. So that's where that mantra came from. That's such where, a, how, did, how did it end? It ended, it ended I, I kept my promise. So I was the third man standing at, um, at 116.5 miles. And I had some... How many started, sorry? We had probably 75 people start. Wow. Yep, yep. Ooh. Who beat you? Like, who's yeah. beat, like who's, <laughs> who are these people? Yeah, look, like, who are they? Look, man, in a, in, a, in a race, anything over 100 miles, it's not always the best athlete, not always the best trained athlete. You may have five. So we could run that race five different times on five different days and have five different winners mm. because it's who has the best day that day. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people mm -hmm. at these races that are equally trained, equally mentally tough, they're equal in all ways, but it's who has the best day that day. So um, that's that's kind of how these ultra marathons work. It's such how, a brutal format. How so? There's one in Maine, um, I think in September, mm -hmm. and I live like 40 minutes from the course, and so I'm trying to like convince myself to go do it with some buddies. And my goal is like three rounds. Like if I can run 12.3 miles, like I'm pumped. I'm gonna go go eat some dinner after but, but see adam you don't but, you don't set a goal man. but then the problem is i know and the pro i think what Hold will on, happen coach is, him through this chief him through this i know right. i think once i'm in it i'm just gonna have the same mentality you are where i'm like all right i'm not quitting like i'm just gonna go until i don't complete it within an hour or whatever right? you don't so, set a goal man yeah simplify go. it bro yep. it's just i mean it's, that's life man simplify it down to the basic level what is this is there a reason why I can't run a 14-minute mile right now? And if there's a reason, there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. If your ankles are – so my ankles were destroyed. Um, basically what had happened was I had rolled my ankles a few times over the course of this run. And also it was so muddy, I had to tie my shoes so tight because if I didn't, the mud would suck my shoes off my feet. Mm -hmm. So this top lace where it runs across this big tendon in the front of your ankle, it had moved back and forth across that shoelace, no telling how many thousands of times on both legs. Just slowly so, sawing at slowly it. Slowly sawing oh, it away. Gosh. So um, <laughs> yeah, it got to the point that I couldn't, I couldn't flex my, my toes toward my knee. I had complete loss of, of function of, of you know, flexing my foot. So that's, that's what happened. I saw this, uh, you might have heard this. Um, I saw this interview with Will Smith a while ago and they'd asked him like, what makes you different than everybody else? And he says, he says, the only thing that's distinctly different about me is I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill. Have you heard about this? He said, he said, he said in nine out of 10 categories, you might have it on me smarter, uh, you know, more creative, sexy, whatever. But if we get on a treadmill together, two things are gonna happen. You're getting off first or I'm gonna die. That's it. And it's the same kind of thing, right? So it's like they say the word decide is to cut away all your other options. It's like it's well, really pretty simple. It uh, is. And I've you noticed know? this is kind of your theme. And it's like even when your dad said, if you don't do the surgery, you're not going to be a SEAL. So then that decision was already made for you, right? Because yeah. you knew you were going to be a SEAL. I wanted, before we maybe move on, I wanted to go back to Bud's one more time. Um, can you describe... Because I'm fascinated with the SEAL training. Like, I think it's one of the coolest, I think it is the coolest thing that um, the American military kind of has. And can you describe the hardest day you had in Bud's training, not just in terms of mentally, but like what were the physical things they had you doing? And what was the context where you're like, it wasn't, you know, it was the, the how many day in a row you had this. I mean, and did you ever have that moment where the bell ever crossed your mind? So to answer that question in particular, no, the, the bell never crossed my Which mind. I, I, ne I never even looked at the bell. You I, like got that out of the way before you showed up. Kind of yeah, and, and, and look, bro, I don't say these words lightly. I was willing to die to get through this training. I don't say that lightly. Yeah. I am serious. 
Um, so no, the bell never crossed my mind, not a single time. As far as the hardest thing about buds is the grind, brother. It's the every day. It's just the grind. There's no evolution that's particularly difficult. If you're just an average guy that's in shape, you can complete every single evolution in buds with 100% perfect execution. You should never fail an evolution. It's not that hard to run four miles in 32 minutes. It's not that hard to swim two miles. It's, it's just the grind. It's every day. Really, that's the hardest thing. Particularly for me was water stuff, man, because I was born and raised in North Georgia and any swimming I had done was like in the pond back behind yeah, the didn't farmer's you say house. the first time you were in a pool was buds? The first time I was in a pool was when I had to pass a physical standards test to get a seal contract. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So that was the first time I was in a pool. I have a pool in my backyard. So do you. And that was the first, that's just crazy to me. Yeah, because I mean, we, we swam in ponds and stuff like yeah. that. And it was like dog paddle, dude. It was like mm -hmm. we had to swim out to, to get our fishing lure unhooked <laughs> off a log. You yeah. know what I mean? So, wow, give that's one, incredible. Give me one thing Ty and I are going to go try in our pool at home that you guys had to do on buds. Mentally, I, I'm, I'm recording this and I'm like, I'm going to get. I always, we always take a challenge from the yeah. podcast and it's going to get to the point eventually where it's like, oh, I got to go do this thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, probably the toughest thing, man, and, and don't do this alone, is a, a 50 meter underwater swim. And you don't get any kicks off the wall. You have to jump in, do a front flip swim 25 down do another flip swim 25 back without coming up without coming goggles. up no kicks off the wall no goggles how long no. does that take i have no clue man i have no clue and a lot of guys don't a couple finish minutes it. though right yeah it's quite a while and and you know a lot of guys don't pass that evolution but the instructors what the instructors are looking for in that particular evolution is will you stay underwater until you pass out My gosh. if you pass out they're going to pull you out of the water. They're going to revive you, and, and you're going to pass the evolution. <laughs> so that's why I say don't try that by yourself. But if you guys got a support crew there, then give it a shot. That's, well, that would be like 14 laps in my little pool. But that's, that's one of those things where the decision, right? Because it's like, okay, two things are going to happen. I'm going to finish it, or I'm going to pass out and get revived. So Man, simple. That would give me so much anxiety. Oh, yeah. So simple, um, brother. If you're okay with it, the, um, the, the SEAL training and things like that, that was a physical difficult challenge and you also had to have a really tuned mind um what are some of the other struggles you talk a lot about the the development you've had through adversity um you know i, I happen to know you're married when did you get married did you get married while you were well, you gotta active ask duty me that question oh <laughs> uh, yeah yeah, active yeah, duty, yeah was, yes so sometime yeah. in the last 12 years yeah, yeah, right? yeah. all right we're good uh it's pretty commonly known that it's pretty hard to have a successful marriage as a team guy. Just mm -hmm. you're constantly gone. You have to put the, the teams kind of above everything. So uh, our job is very different, except for there's some similar things in that our guys work really unconventional hours. Most of us don't put our kids to bed at night. Most of us don't have dinner with our family. We work when other people don't work. Yep. We travel a lot. We're gone. And the strain on a relationship is not near what you guys deal with, but it's there and it's yeah. true. So maybe if you don't mind speaking to some of the challenges that you've had and how have you made your family successful? Mm. I'll answer that the best I can, brother. And, and yeah, you're exactly right. When you're in the teams, that is front and center. If you don't, if you don't focus on that one thing, your job 100%, then you, you'll get killed or your friend will, will you might lose your friend. So it's totally necessary, but it is extremely hard on a, on a marriage because when you become completely consumed with one thing, everything else around you is going to suffer. And I still struggle with that today in my life. I become completely consumed with, with, it, with a given goal or task and, and things around me suffer. I have, to I have to stay conscious of that at all times. But with my wife... It was hard being gone all the time. And uh, my wife had a battle with addiction, drug addiction. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to blame that on, on me being gone all the time. I don't know, I don't know why it happened, um, but it happened. And the crazy thing is... Did it develop when you were gone? Um, never really. I, I can't put a finger on when it developed because... Here's the thing, man. When you're in the SEAL teams, you're traveling about 300 days out of the year. 
So when you come home and you've got two or three days with your loved one, yeah. you want to make the best of it. So you don't ask questions. You guys, it's just like you're going to live the dream for those two or three days, mm -hmm. right? You need it. And she's yeah. not trying to throw yeah. it on you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, um, so that happened. And what it's from, I don't know. But, but I can tell you that the only way that I can explain her recovery, it was, it was a God thing, man. It was completely out of my hands. Um, all I knew how to do was was pray. Um, I did go to my my command and say, "Hey, this is what I got going on," and the the teams take care of their guys. So they gave they they pulled me back, put me in an instructor role. So I had a little more time at home to walk through that with my wife, and that's the thing is, you know, a lot of guys I think would would be ashamed if if something like that was happening not even just that but it could be anything was happening in their personal life there's nothing to be ashamed of man this is life mm -hmm. this is life brother if you need if you need some help reach out you got to tell your your brothers you got to tell your your guys that that you look up to that you respect hey this is what i got going on and i need to step out for a minute and it, you know, uh, it seems like you guys have an awesome company, and and I I would imagine that wouldn't be any issue. Yeah. So it's interesting that people have a hard time doing it. Why do you think that is, right? Because it's like, why would you be ashamed of that, right? It it seems so logical, but that's what we do. We well, almost. I think when you're competitive, anytime something's going wrong in your life, it's like it almost feels like a loss to admit something's wrong. You know, mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of pride. There's a bit of ego. I think there's probably an element of self-blame where you're like, man, I, I hate to admit that I've allowed something like this to happen within my house, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so um, did it take you some time to kind of ask for help or I guess uh, kind of talk to, you know, your team? Yeah, it took me a little while, um, yeah, to make the decision to do that. And... It, are you I, worried that you could lose your your, your position no, or deployment? Not or at all, man. Like not at all. We we take we're, we're brothers, man. We take care of each mm -hmm. other. It does it doesn't matter. Um, so I wasn't concerned at all about that. And and I think I used to be a very prideful person. Um, I used to well well when you when you become a seal, they they turn you into this alpha male because that's what that's what's required of you, and. I don't know if this is the same out in the business world, but you've got your alpha males. And when one of them shows weakness, there's a potential for the others to attack that that's one, that, is is that, that, one that, is sh <laughs> that shows weakness. Yeah. And that's wrong. That, that is so wrong. And, and luckily, I didn't experience that with, with the teams, right? Mm -hmm. They took care of me. Um, well, and it seems like, you know, from listening to some of the other content you've put out, this this mantra of I've already made the decision once kind of came into play with your family the because you have options right it's do I want to deal with this at all is it even fixable but you mentioned on one of the podcasts uh, some truth that your brother spoke on the situation if you wouldn't mind sharing that yeah he did so my little brother Blake Wright I called him up one day and I said Blake I don't know how much longer I can do this man um, it was it was bad and I'm just a man. Like I said, we're all made of the same stuff, right? I have a breaking point. And my little brother told me, he said, Chad, you're married. You don't have a choice. Just that never quit mindset, that never quit mentality. You don't have a choice. Well, at that point, that comment there again simplified the whole matter. I trusted Blake as a counselor to me. And when I took his advice, it became so simple. Okay, I don't have a choice. So we're going to work through this recovery hand in hand. And now I have the best marriage on earth. My wife is my best friend. Mm -hmm. um, she's, I, I can't, I, I don't even know how to describe her. It's good every day. So yeah. I'm so happy 
that, that I took that advice. Well, that's the same mentality, right? Because you could get stuck in, this is what I'm going through right now. But you would never, like, if, if you're out, you know, on deployment with one of your brothers in the, in the teams and one of them's hurt, that's it. You're bringing him home. You're, you're, you've already made that decision. And it's cool that he was able to relate that back to yeah. the and, family. And, and it's there, the same thing. And there again, that's that furnace. So why is my, why is my marriage so good now? because we went through a really hot furnace of adversity. Mm -hmm. And now we appreciate every minute that we spend together because we know what it could be like. It's that furnace, man. Yeah. Something I've always been a little envious of is the brotherhood that SEALs have. Can you just kind of share the, that, that power of doing hard things together and just the bonds that are formed through that kind of stuff. Definitely, man. And, and you see that. And not that, even just through buds, but like, yeah. I mean, you were in the, you were a SEAL for 12 years. Are you with the same group of guys for that full 12 years? Are you, how does that work? For the most part you are. I mean, guys come in and out and come and go, but, but you've got a core group that pretty much stay together their entire career. How big is it? Most team? of the time. Uh, I couldn't put a number on a team. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a low number. It's, it's a tight group of guys, right? Mm -hmm. We all, we all know each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and yes, you see that brotherhood formed through adversity in all different walks of life. You see it in the military, you see it in running. That's what draws me so much to ultra running, right? Um, is because you go out and you spend... You run a hundred miles with a dude and you guys go through that full spectrum of, of life, pain, suffering, happy, joy, you know, down in the dumps, you go through life in a day and it builds a bond that's everlasting. And it's the same thing in the teams. Um, it's, 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 it's very important. That's why I would challenge anyone. Uh, it's important to spend time with each other outside of work. Mm -hmm doing hard stuff. It's like Ty, you and Adam, if you guys went tomorrow and climbed Mount Olympus or climbed Lone Peak, you guys would be closer after that experience and you would work better together because of that experience. Mm -hmm. And the SEAL teams was the same way. We spent a lot of time together outside of work. Um, but you knew while you were at work that no matter what happened, no matter if you had an argument with a guy or a guy didn't necessarily like you outside of work, you knew he had your back. And it's the same way here it, when I meet a SEAL, you know, out, out, on the, out on the streets or at an airport now, even, even now that I'm out. Um, I don't care if the dude's been retired for 20 years, I can immediately trust him. Can you spot a SEAL? I can. You can? Really? Yeah. <laughs> I've met like, a you're few at the years, airport. You you're so yeah. different, man. You're at the airport, and you do a quick scan, and you're like... You really can? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's Pick cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's tight. Uh, yeah, we get so close, man. Literally, we can be on patrol at night, uh, and no nods, no night vision, no light, patrolling in the woods, and you can just see a faint outline of your teammate. You, there might be 12 of you in the patrol. You know every person in that patrol just by the way they walk, just by their footsteps. So at the airport, you notice a guy like doing a quick scan. He's orienting himself. <laughs> he's, ready, he's ready for whatever. He's That's sitting it. in the corner. You know, he's making sure he had, can see the whole place. You're like, place. There's, there's two in this building right now. Yeah. No. Right. yeah. Um, talk about the Revenant. This thing's crazy. Uh, I, I just started reading up on it, but tell, tell the listeners what that is and what would possess a person to do that. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the, the Revenant, I think, meant to me. So when, when the Navy told me that my career was over, um, because of injuries I had sustained, basically it became unsafe for me to be in certain situations because of injuries that I had sustained. Um, like what kind like blast concussions? Yeah, concussions, okay. blast exposure. It's, it's just really destroyed my balance. Mm. Um, so I have a lot of problems with that. And you can see how that could be an issue downrange. Yeah. How, um, how, do you mind if I ask how close you were to 
the blast that caused the issue. I mean, it I'm was just, multiple. I and, mean, and, I just see like the movies, right? So yeah, yeah. I'm like, but I'm sure real life's much different. It was thousands upon. I was a breacher, so oh. it was thousands upon thousands of blasts. So it what was does a, a breacher do? It, we we are explosives experts, so we if if we need to get into a building or into a, a compound, it's my job to get the guys in, and that's usually done by explosives. So you're right so, there next so to you're the, the guy the doors that's and stuff. maneuvering up, basically getting the explosive on the barricade or whatever, and then getting out of the way. That's right. Blows up, and then those guys just come in hot. That's right. Yeah. Got yeah. It. So as a breacher, you take the brunt force of wow, of man. the explosion because you're it's your job to make sure that it goes high order and that it's a good breach, right? So you're in the the front of that stack every time. So it was cumulative. But when the Navy said, okay, well, we're going to put you out to pasture, you know what I mean? I'm not going to die in a chair, right? So what I do, I went and signed up for what I would say is probably the hardest race on earth. <clears throat> and it's called the Revenant. It's out in New Zealand, held on the South, the South Island. The race director's name is Scott Worthington. Awesome dude. He doesn't cut any corners. He puts on one of the best events on earth, in my opinion. When was this event? This was this past January, and we'll be going again this January. That's so <laughs> Didn't get enough the first no, time. No, yeah. So no one finished. Um, That's a crazy thing. Yeah. So how many people have run this race? So I don't know the exact numbers, um, but that – so this past January, I think we had about 30 competitors and – they were very good athletes. They were Scott. Scott went around and handpicked quite a few of them because mm -hmm. he wanted to see if anyone could complete this challenge, and um, no one finished. And for for a lot of different reasons, there's a lot of things at the Revenant that are completely out of your control, um, environmental factors. Uh, this past year, we had an inversion layer, which is really thick fog, move in right off the start line and I could literally see my feet and that was it. So you can't navigate in that. Uh, you just can't. Well, and there's no course. I mean, there's no there's no It's all road. off trail. Yeah, so it's map and compass navigation only through the mountains of the South Island. Um, and do you get to where you do you get to time yourself or anything like that? Cuz you no have watches. to meet but you have to meet certain uh, time requirements so you just don't know how you're doing. You don't know, you don't have a clue and and Scott what he'll do I don't know if I'm supposed to tell about this or not, but what Scott will do is on some of the checkpoints, Scott will have a watch at the checkpoint, but the time won't be set right. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> As if you it'll need be like that. two or three hours As off, If you need man. that, you know. Yeah, so, so you literally have no idea what time it is and a lot of times where you are. Yeah, I mean, you lose track of days, dude. Hold on. So the race is you show up to a place and the guy's like, here's the race. You got to navigate these mountains. Well, you get a you get a map that has the checkpoints. So basically, what it is, it's a fifty kilometer loop, and Scott has placed checkpoints around this fifty kilometer loop, mm -hmm. and they basically guide you along the course that he wants you to go because you have to hit the checkpoints in sequence. And you have a, a paper map. You have a paper map and, and a, a compass. compass. Yeah, and that's it. That's it. Do you, you know start at different if you times gave... so you're not working mm -hmm. as a group, or are nope, you? No, work... it's they want you to work as a group. Oh, it's going to take a group to, to ever oh, finish really? that race. It's it's going to take a couple of guys that that are really good that team up, and and just have a perfect race up on a perfect day so to you're finish. Working as a team. You try to, yeah. Is, uh, are is there like a pecking order established when you first start? Like all of a sudden, some guys like taking the lead on because how does how does all of a sudden someone who's in the front of the pack not mislead the whole peloton you know well with that race particular you you work as a team but every individual is conscious of where they're going so everyone on that say you group up with you know three other dudes and you guys are going to try to knock this race out together mm -hmm. Everyone in that group knows how to nav, knows where they're at, and we can all do each other's job, just like in a SEAL platoon. There's not one guy that can nav and, you know, one guy that, you know, can do this or that. We can all do the, the jobs that need to be done. And so the, w the best way to make it flow is whoever's feeling the best at the time 
takes that leadership position, takes that nav, Listen. the front of the patrol, whatever it may be. But you're watching, you're watching each other, and when you see that guy up front, he's getting a little tired, man. You bump him out. You know, and that's just a respect thing. That's having respect for each other. I'll bet you if you gave most people here in Lehigh a paper compass and a map, they couldn't make it to the airport, let alone like trying to, I mean, we it's, just don't do it. It's if, if, you, if you've ever been out driving and your phone dies, you don't have a charge cable, it's an emergency. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, yeah. Like, well, I actually, it's easy here in Utah because you have the mountains right. as yeah. your, as your, you know. We'll go to the East Coast the where East everything's Coast, curvy. And when I moved out East, I just felt like a mouse in a maze. And I'm like, where are the neighborhoods? All I can see is trees, you know, so. You come to Utah, you just have the mountains. It's, you got all these Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I never but, go anywhere without a compass, man. I always have one on my wrist. So, Talk about um, your your day with Jesse. It was really interesting. I, I, I love the how he reached out to you and what your purpose and format was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hesitant to tell, to get too deep into a story without all parties available to tell their sides, right? There's nothing bad to say about it. It was an awesome day. Um, but the basis of that evolution was Jesse's an awesome dude, awesome runner, awesome human being all the way around. And he's always trying to better himself. And he wanted to learn and see the specific mindset that I utilize in action. So that was the reason that we met up to do that run. And he just hit you up, right? He yeah, Jesse hit me up on uh, on Instagram, and um, yeah, flew out. We spent a day running. We ran 50 miles. Couple rules. Um, we had to run until I said stop, so they didn't know how far we were going. The second rule was no negative talk. And to kind of foster that, we would share something each hour that we were thankful for. So each of us would share something we were thankful for, and we would talk around those topics during that hour, right? That's so important because the most important thing when it comes to your mindset and your success is the stuff that comes out of your mouth. There's so much power in the spoken word. There's power in positivity, but when you speak it, when you let it out of your head and it becomes something real, something that can be measured in waves, that's when it becomes powerful. So that's what we practice was the power of, the, of, of the positivity delivered through the spoken word. And you, you can't understand how powerful that is until you see it happen. And it happened that day. We ran 50 miles. Uh, Mark Brown was with us. Mark was a former NFL player. Super good athlete. Awesome dude all the way around, just like Jesse. He added a marathon onto his distance PR, wow. running distance PR through the power of positivity and the spoken mm -hmm. word. And uh, Jesse crushed, you know, crushed some of his, his goals that he was trying to break through to. And it was all because of that. And it even comes down to stuff as simple as cursing. And it sounds so silly. And I'm not preaching to you guys. I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm just telling you what works. Curse words in and of themselves None of them have a positive meaning. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, totally. None of them have a positive meaning. Yet we use them day in and day out. Some of us, every other or every third word that comes out of our mouth. Well, especially in your circle, it's an abnormal yeah. thing. Like, I don't want to stereotype you and put you in a box, but I would think, especially given Itzler's previous training that was very public with Goggins, you're very different, right? So yeah. he comes, I, I think consistent is... We're going to run till I say stop. All right, that 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 fits. But to say we're going to speak positively, we're not going to swear, and we're going to talk about things we're grateful for, that that seems very abnormal. But I love it because, you know, even earlier when we were talking, we we're like, well, how you know, 
do most SEAL guys look like you? And you're like, it's all right here. You know what I mean? It's all, it's all in their brain. Mm -hmm. We do a thing on, our, on a lot of our walls, like in our sales meetings, where like, hey, there's three or four rules. Work the hours, okay? Do your job, hit the numbers, and no negativity. And That's a lot of awesome, it is just brother. the world, things are hard enough. I don't need that on top of it. And especially I'd imagine when you're running and you're in the solitude of your own head, it's like if you're running next to someone that kept being like, hey, Chad, your form's terrible. Hey, Chad, you're not going to be able to make it. Hey, Chad, remember last, this is the farthest you've ever run. Hey, mm -hmm. Chad, your ankle hurts. You'd be like, shut up. Mm -hmm. Go away. I don't need this. But if someone was next to you being like, hey, you still got time. You're good. You'd want to hang out with that guy, right? It's yep. like that's, yep. that's, that's what's in yep. your brain, it's right? It's contagious, man. How do you... So our guys go out and they're by themselves. And I think 80 to 90 percent of our job, I mean, they're out in the field. They're knocking on doors trying to sell solar. Right. I think most of the job is mental. Anyone can go walk around for five hours and knock doors all day. That's not hard. Right. Physically, that's not a hard thing to do. It's the mental part. So when you're running by yourself, and I 100% agree with you. There's something magical that happens when you say something out loud, when you put it out into the universe, or when you write something down, right? Same yeah. kind of thing. So how do you win those mental battles when it's just you alone um, and you're running, you know, or you're just in a hard situation by yourself? What are the, the mantras that you use and the, the, you know, the things that you do to stay positive? Mm. I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind, brother, is I talk to myself all the time. I really do. I talk positive. When you're running or just in general? Or? Just in general. When I'm, when I'm running, uh, when, when I'm out here hiking this mountain. And you say and, it out loud? And I, and I speak it out loud, yes. And, and I'm a Christian. I pray. I pray out loud. I right. never pray to myself. Mm -hmm. I speak to myself. I speak to God. All those things are, are, you know, the spoken word. I, they, there's so much power in that, and it sounds like you know what, what you know, you know, you, you know what we're talking about. So that's a big thing that I do. And uh, is it specific things you say? Do you have, or is it just positive talk and you keep it going? It's, it's just positive talk. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it may, maybe it's maybe it's me being thankful for 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 whatever's going on that day, or what happened yesterday, or you know, it can be anything. It's just positivity and and. The weird thing is, is until you get used to this, uh, when you try to implement this, you realize that you, you realize how negative your speech has been, because when you try to implement this into your day to day life, you find yourself just being quiet hmm. for a long, long time. You almost have to learn, relearn how to have conversation in the office, at your job, in your family, with your home, you know, or in your home with your family, you got to relearn how to talk. And there's like a transition where it's like, dang, <laughs> if I have to be positive, I really don't have that much to talk about right now. <laughs> well, but, it's probably a habit like, like not quitting, right? Like, yeah. That's the easy thing to do. The easy thing to do is like, I'm tired. I'm going to stop here. That's the, that's the easy thing. Well, the easy thing to do is, is look around and be like, this sucks. Or this traffic, yeah, yeah. or this whatever. This is oh, this boss, whatever. That's the easy thing to do. So it's almost like a, a learned skill. It's not even. Right? I was just gonna say that it's not even that it's easier. Well, it's easier to be negative, and it's habitual, right? You actually develop a habit of instantly having your brain go to a negative place yep. in hard situations, and it's like a muscle you have to retrain yes, and it say. Is. No, I'm I'm refusing to look at this from any negative standpoint. I'm gonna figure out how to make it positive, and um, that's something I'm working on with my kids right now. They they say something negative about going to bed on time or whatever, and I'm like, nope. How can we're gonna play a game? I want you guys. I don't care how ridiculous it sounds. We're gonna talk about how amazing it is that you get to go to bed on time and why it's amazing, right? And I make them all like think of something you know, awesome, funny to brother. say. But I'm like trying to get them, you know, to because I'm guilty of it as much as anybody. I mean, it's like I think everybody kind of is unless you consciously make that decision to train your brain to think positive. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. And, and this stuff goes beyond far beyond just your mindset. The things that you say affect your physical body. They affect, I, I mean, I would go as far as to say 
negative people are probably sick more often. They're in the hospital more often. They I agree uh, with that. They totally. affect you in in the, in like deep deep ways, right? So I mean, another thing that we use running that goes along with positive thinking, and we we'll also use it in the SEAL teams. It's suffer in silence or don't give a voice to your pain, right? Because when something hurts, if you speak it out loud, you give it a voice, it becomes real, that's when it becomes detrimental. And the actual issue, if it's an injury or, or something going on, maybe it's your stomach, something like that, you'll notice a distinct shift when you give it a voice it gains so much power and it'll destroy you. No, that's very that true. So deep. Yeah, it's very true. Well, we, we think about it. I've, you, you keep saying the spoken word. I've thought about it with the written word before. Like, mm -hmm. I think the written word's a little bit easier to watch because before you hit send on that email, that online comment, you can stop for a second and look at it because, but once you send it, it's alive. You can't control that's it anymore. It. Somebody else can, can misquote, screenshot, can pass it around, can screenshot, right? You're saying the spoken word, once it leaves your mouth, it's alive. It is. It's almost like this living virus that can go straight to your ankle or straight to your heart totally. or straight to the people that you work with. That's a really that's a really powerful mindset. It's so powerful, brother. I what? wish to ever I wish I want everyone to grasp this and try to implement it and just see the difference it makes in your performance at work, in your relationships at home, in your performance in your hobbies, fitness, all those things. If you can if you can grasp this and let it work. It's going to work. I promise. I believe that. Um, so we're about time to uh, close out, but what do you have next? What's next for Chad Wright? What are you working on? You have a race that you're hosting and putting on. Is that right? Well, so we're, we're going to host a race probably next spring. Um, right now, what's, I guess, immediately coming up, I've got a hundred miler down in Georgia in September. Um, in October, we're going out to Jesse's race called 29029. And we're going to be running that, or I'm going to be, com I don't know if it's competing. It's like a really cool, he's put together an awesome, ev it's an event. Mm. It's not necessarily a race. So the way you go up and down the Yeah, you, you go up the mountain, oh, the, the mountain Everest, Everest one. Basically. Until you accumulate 29029. Is it in Utah? Those here, one here and one in Vermont. Yeah, oh, okay. so the one here is this month, and then the one in Vermont's in October. Okay. So I'm going to well, go out there. When you're up there, we should, uh, we should get, I mean, I don't know how long you're going to be up there, but yeah, that's, I mean, I live. Yeah, I live like an hour from that event. I should just do the event. Yeah, climb the thing. Don't just be there. Yeah, geez. well, I'm gonna be there. I'm on the crew. It's, uh, it sounds I'll awesome, man. Crew. I'm looking forward to it. And and I think I think my whole mindset around there. I'm not. I don't really. I'm not thinking that I'm gonna go there to like knock this out as fast as I can and completely destroy myself. I want to spend time with people on the course. I want to pass along you know, this, these things to mm -hmm. other people, because that's my new mission. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I'm passionate about. I don't learn near as much when I win a race, when I run first place, the whole race, I don't learn near as much and I don't get near as much value from the event as when I hang back and run middle of the pack or back of the pack. And I get to pass these skills along to other people and I just see them flourish. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, this is what this is what it's all about. That's what it's all about for me now. So cool. And and then we got the Revenant in January. We'll be going back out to compete there. So, man, we'll be rooting for you. I definitely will not be on that rock looking for you. I trust you got that figured out. But you guys would have a blast, man. Hey, man, we're so grateful for you coming out and sharing with our group. I think this message of positivity. It's it, even as you speak the words, it 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 lifts it's light it's great i think it's very valuable awesome tons of respect for what you do appreciation for what you do our guys are gonna love it yeah man thanks for sharing with us oh, it's so. my pleasure brother yeah this has been chad wright this is another episode of electric people thank you for joining us thanks for hanging out with us today this is electric people take these principles and go be electric